Welcome to the next edition of Affiliate ABCs. I'm Deborah Carney, and I have a guest today, Sean Collins. Most of you know that Sean and uh, Missy Ward produce the Affiliate Summit conferences a couple of times a year, and they also have a magazine called Feedfront. And Sean recently invited me to do a little uh, short piece on how to take photos for your to use on your website. And I thought it would be a great topic for a podcast. So, hi, Sean. Welcome to Affiliate ABCs. Hey there, Deb. Thanks a lot for having me. It's great to be here. Well, I, I, I'm I doing like a reverse type of an interview format, and I'm going to be doing more of these in the future. You get to be the first one. Instead of me doing the interviewing, I'm going to let you do the interviewing, so I'm going to let you take over. Excellent. So so today we're going to talk about just some different tips for taking pictures for your site. And I guess the, the first most logical place to go to here is just talking about what kind of camera you should have. And I guess um, I'm actually in the market for one. Right now I have a... It's a Casio EXZ1200 from the Exilum line. Okay. And I feel like I need something better, so I'd love to just – I can benefit from your advice here that you're giving to everybody else. Okay. Well, um, camera choice is really – it's a very personal thing, but when you choose a camera, you really have to decide what you're going to be doing with it. Now, somebody like you, you travel a lot, and you should have a camera that's a balance between being small – and easy to carry around, but that will give you really excellent resolution because what if you hit that really great sunset shot, you know, or that that really great, you know, a whale is jumping off the coast of California or something, and you want to be able to sell it as a print in addition to using it just on your website. Um, I would recommend that you get a camera that's probably around 10, 10 megapixels. Most of them seem to be about 8 to 10 right now. And what a lot of people don't know is that 10 megapixels, 8 megapixels actually, is equivalent to a 35 millimeter negative. So that's kind of your benchmark for knowing whether you can make large prints from your, um, from your megapixel camera or not. Now the other thing to consider because you can get a DSLR that has um, 10 megapixels, and that's like seven dollars $800. But you also have your small pocket-sized 10 megapixel camera, and that's like two or $300. And you probably are thinking, well, what the heck is the difference? The pocket-sized camera has less of a zoom, or it has a digital zoom instead of an optical zoom. So it's much better if you want to take pictures for the web or if you want to take pictures that you're never going to print bigger than 8 by 10 inches. Um, you would only go to a big DSLR if you want to do really high-quality, large prints. So does that make sense so far? Yeah, I think so. The, the one that I have right now, it's a 12.1 megapixels, and I wasn't even sure what that means, but I was just looking at a, a picture that I took recently, and it says that the resolution was 4,000 by 3,000. Okay. 4,000 by 3,000 is a really good size. The other difference in the smaller cameras versus the big cameras is the big cameras allow you to change lenses so that you can do fancy things, and you can zoom in really, really close, and like I said, you can have a much higher quality. The um, megapixels are a little bit misleading now because that's an easy way for um, a camera manufacturer to make it look like they have a better camera. Again, with the smaller cameras, if you've got 12 megapixels, that's really good because that'll give you a high quality um, picture because it gives you a lot of pixels in a small space. But on the other hand, if you had, it doesn't have the quality of optics. So each of those megapixels won't be as crisp as if you had a DSLR. So what you want to look for, if you're looking for, if you're not happy with the quality of the pictures that you're getting out of your current camera, what you want to do is you want to look at, and you probably want to do this online, you want to do some searching, maybe even at Flickr, because they list out the camera types that people are using. Um, see if there's a way to search on some of the Canons and see some of the photos. If you're looking for a camera, see some of the photos that have been produced using that camera. Um, I don't know. It's it's The small cameras have come up so much in quality, but again, you have such a little tiny, you have such a little tiny lens. What you want now 
instead of just having more megapixels is you want better optics. Uh, you want a higher quality optical zoom as opposed to a digital zoom. And you want um, like a name, like the Sony cameras use Carl Zeiss lenses, which that is a known brand that's very good optics. And that's one of the reasons I've actually stayed with Sony um, digital cameras since they since they produced the first more four megapixel one, which was all the rage back in the day. Um, my first Sony digital had a Carl Zeiss lens, and I can still use those four megapixel photos and blow them up to twenty by thirty without any loss in quality. Um, when you switch to a digital zoom, the digital zoom instead of being a true zoom just takes and and actually it like does a, a crop inside the camera and it just blows everything up including the pixels so that the pictures aren't as sharp they're um they're blurry and a little bit ragged so like um i'm looking at my camera now that has a an optical zoom of three times right so what would you recommend to be like the ideal optical zoom if you wanted to blow up some pictures you probably want an optical zoom of about uh you probably want like about six to ten um at three basically it's like taking three steps closer to the person or the building that you're taking a photo of you're not really getting very much zoom at all um and the digital zoom probably you probably have a digital zoom that goes up to what about 10 yeah, i'm not sure but whenever i guess whenever i do that it always gives a pretty junky picture exactly because like i said that it just blows up the pixels instead of actually getting closer to your subject so um definitely that's where that's why your camera is even though it's 12 megapixels you're not getting the quality you want because when you try to get closer to something it's like you're always far away from whatever you're taking the picture of and you have to crop it really close and blow it up really big in order to see what you really wanted to get a picture of i would try to find something that's at least eight eight times optical zoom yeah i was looking at one um part of my entertainment whenever i fly is always to read the sky mall magazine and i see there's a nude I'm not sure how new it is, but there's an, another one in this line of Exelm cameras from Casio because I sort of like these. And it's a high-speed one, mm -hmm. and it has a 20 times optical zoom and a 9.1 megapixel. Wow. Now, see, I would go for that instead. I would go for the 9 megapixel with the 20 times optical zoom because you have better optics – and then the 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 picture that it takes is going to be the file that it creates is going to be much higher quality than the one you're getting with your 12 megapixel at only three optical zoom. Yeah, the the one thing I'd be giving away there though is that I I can tell from it looks great that it has like a, a zoom that goes out and it's looks like a nice quality camera, but the one I have right now it's like the size of like an iPod, like a little bit right. thicker maybe, but it, but I can like literally just fit it in my pocket comfortably. But this one looks like I clearly can't do that, which Definitely makes it less convenient. Right. Yeah, that's what you have to give up. You always have to consider when you're going to be using it and whether size means more. And you know what? You have this as your second camera. So for, you know, if you're just going for a walk down the street and you just want to have a camera in your pocket in case you see something cool or for when you're at a party and you just want to snap around at the party and you don't care if things are very close, you take the little skinny one. And when you want to do something a little more serious, then you carry the little bit bigger one. So it's um, which of those things that the the megapixels that matter when you're dealing with taking a picture like in a nightclub or something? Because my camera now just it's horrible whenever I take it in a dark environment like that. Um, what the problem is with that is the flash and the strength of the flash, and whether it can handle low light. That actually has nothing to do with the megapixels. It has to do with the sensitivity of the lens and whether the camera can handle. Now, here's a word that most people these days don't know. It was, you know, something that you knew when you do film. You have to know the ISO of the film speed and the higher ISO let you take photos in lower light. And um, now that we're in digital, they still use that sort of, but most people don't really know what it means. So normally when you shoot pictures, your digital camera is like set, it sets itself at about 100 ISO. And that's where you're going to get the highest quality. When your ISO number goes up, it kind of fills in the blanks with darkness 
and that's why you don't get the greatest pictures in dim light. And if your flash doesn't carry very far, then you don't get, it doesn't get lit the way you want it to be lit. Um, so the things you need to look for are whether it has high, whether it's made specifically to shoot in low light. Some of the cameras will have on them that they're better in low light than others. And you want to kind of see, you know, how far, if it'll tell you how far the flash goes. You really want a flash that'll go 10 to 15 feet um, if it tells you that information. Gotcha. So, um, so is there like a, for people that are just shooting for the web, I guess they just have, they need a lot less. Like I think you mentioned that they just need something that's like 500 by 500 pixels. Yes. When you, when you actually put the photo on the website, all you, you only want it to be 500 by 500 pixels. So you can shoot like with your iPhone, if you're filling the frame with what you're taking photos of um, a lot of camera phones actually have a good enough quality but let's say you have a travel blog and you're on vacation and you're trying to take photos that you're you're not going to try and blow them up and use them for prints you just want to have them so that you can put them on your website and tell how you had such a great trip and then link back to the agency that you bought your trip from um, you really, the camera that you have right now, the, the three times zoom and the 12 megapixel, that'll take, like you said, your file size is 400, 4,000 by 3,000. That's huge. And you need to shrink that down. And if you, if you do take something from far away, you can crop in because you really, for the web, only want 500 by 500 maximum to be on your web page, or it will take too long for that file to load and it'll slow down your web page. Um, there's a lot of software that will help you crop, and some of them, uh, most of the operating systems come with the software built in now. In Windows Vista, there's the Windows Picture Editor, and it has a little fix button, and you can crop your images, and you can auto-adjust the color, and do all kinds of things right within that software without having to buy anything else. Um, so if you're... You know, if you're if you're just shooting for the web, you're just doing some uh, like you for your for one of your sites, you did video. Now, yeah. if you don't want to do videos, but you just want to do some product pictures, like you bought a really cool thing, and you know your kid, you bought some really cool T-shirts from Cafe Press for your kids, you know, and you took some pictures of them wearing the shirts. You know, you don't need a big wonderful file for that. You just need something that's small but that's crisp and clear and well lit. Yeah, and um, one thing that I – just speaking of like having the correct width and size and everything, one thing that I do just to make it even easier, I have some software that I usually resize in. Like I use PaintShop Pro and some other things, but I, I also oftentimes, if it's a picture that I think is worthy of putting on my blog or wherever, I just upload it to my Flickr account, and I just use the 500-width version there. <laughs> That's a great idea. I love PaintShop Pro. I've been using it since – like version six or seven and I actually don't even I usually recommend to people go to Amazon and try to get um, one of the older versions because I'm not that excited about the newer versions and I actually like paint shop pro version eight if you can still get a hold of it and nine if you can't get eight you can still usually find nine um, if actually, and, yeah, I was looking at my computer. I have, I have six. Yeah, yeah, six. I started around seven, and there were some big changes between seven and eight, and I absolutely love eight. Um, there's just a few things in the newest version that I use it for, but I actually, it crashes a lot in Vista. <laughs> so I, I try to use eight more often. Um, That's funny because six work, works fine in Vista. Okay, then I might go find that and see if I can download it because there's some things that, you know, you just want to do easily and you don't want to mess around. For people looking for free software that doesn't, that don't like the software that's built in, there's something on the web called GIMP. I've never gotten into using it, but there are some people that swear by it. Um, but that's a great idea about just uploading it to your Flickr account and then just take down the, the crunched image that they create because that's perfect for the web. Yeah, and it looks like a nice quality image whenever I do that, so I'm happy with doing that. And then you have to worry about uploading or anything. You just have their hosting. Yep. 
Yep, that's a great that's a great idea. I I like that. I was going to bring up Flickr if you had talked about it, if we got into microstock at all, which um, we probably won't cover in this podcast. But um, Flickr has become useful for a lot of things, but unfortunately, some of the things that it's become useful for, I don't want to deal with because it's easy for people to take other people's pictures off of Flickr, and I don't. That, something I'm not happy about. But anyway, back to topic. <laughs> <laughs> no rants the other, today? Yeah, what? No rants today? No rants today, no. <laughs> I'm going to be nice today. Um, one of the other things that I mentioned in the article was about, you know, holding your camera steady. One of the things about the really tiny cameras, like your your little tiny camera, um, and this happens, this can be something about your pictures at night or the ones in clubs and things. Part of the problem is like in a club, even though you might have slowed it down or your flash didn't fire, um, it may be on a setting where it's, it's blurring instead of holding the, instead of being steady. Um, one of the things, if you're outdoors at night, let's say, Back to my travel example, let's say you're in New York City and you want to get pictures of the buildings at night and they look all bright and they look great in your in your preview and then you take the picture and you look at it and it's all it's all blurry, the lights are all streaked. Find something like a, a mailbox or a light post even and just lean up against it and use it as a tripod. I try to, uh, people laugh at me because I use other people as a tripod. I'll lean on somebody's shoulder or, you know, put my camera on their head just because it's a little, you know, it's something stable. It's two of us being stable instead of one. And I've actually gotten some nice nighttime pictures that way. And You're as far a little as... too tall. You're a little too tall. No one can use you as a tripod. <laughs> <laughs> as far as tripods, like, like one thing that I do sometimes, if I just want to take a picture of myself holding up some kind of item, I'll just set for like a 10 second delay and then I'll run back around behind my desk or something. Yep. Yep. And you can set your camera on a desk if you don't have a tripod or you can get one of those little tiny ones. That's just like, you know, three inches off the table. Yeah. But the um one that I got, I, I think if I'm remembering correctly, it was only like $20 or so at, mm -hmm. at Target and it seems to do the job. Is there like a, a good brand of tripod you'd recommend or does it not really matter? It doesn't really matter. You just have to find one that's small enough to fit in your camera bag and that's comfortable for you to use. If you're just going to use it around the house if, or if you're going to use it as a little, you're going to want something a little sturdier if you're going to actually do some videos of yourself or if you're going to do a lot of photography of yourself so you can set it steady. Um, but usually, like I said, a lot of times I'll just use a book or a you know, put it on the tabletop as long as you can aim it up so that if you sometimes if the camera is too close to the surface, if you set it on a table, you end up getting table in the foreground. So that's where the tripod comes in handy. Yeah, the one that I have, it's not really small enough to go into a bag. It's I guess even when it's collapsed, it's still like at least 18 or 24 inches long. Oh, OK. So, so you have a full size one. There are, there are a lot of really nice little six inch um, tabletop ones. Yeah, I have. I have some of those, but I, I like to have this one just so, like, if I'm at my desk, I can set it so it's above me a little bit because I, I sort of like to shoot down instead of shooting up so I have less chins. Yes. There are um, – if you're going to get a full-size – I can't remember the name of the brand right now, but you want what Targus. You want a nice, steady – um, you might as well invest for the $20 one, I'd say go for the really tiny ones. You can get those for around 20 bucks, but if you're going to go for the really big one, you can get them for 20 bucks, but those are the ones I've found not to be quite so steady. Um, if you can get one, sometimes you can get the 40 in the 40 to $50 range, you're going to get something that's really sturdy. And sometimes you can catch those on sale. Uh, we have a really nice one here that was on sale at um, Radio Shack one day, and it was a $40 one marked down to 20 and I wish we had bought like three or four of them because <laughs> it's, it's really nice and steady. And the one that we picked up a couple weeks later that was 20 bucks is very flimsy, and it tends to collapse on me and makes me pretty mad. It's another thing I rant about. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's something where you definitely, especially I'll put a – a camcorder on there sometimes, so I guess you don't want to chintz out there and yes, you don't it. want yeah, you don't want to if you're if you're using a two hundred dollar camera, sometimes you don't quite care, but when you're using a six hundred dollar Sony or a uh, you know eight hundred dollar Canon and you're setting it on a twenty dollar tripod and it falls over and smashes your camera, you're not too happy. So and um, 
here's here's a question I'm going to throw back at you. What are you using these days for video? Are you using your your little digital camera, or do you have a separate camcorder? I've got a, a camcorder that I um. Let's see if I can find the model real quick here. But I um I use just the the Casio Exilum just to whenever I go to conferences, just because it's so much easier. I have to tote a bag around with me, mm -hmm. so it's just a lot more convenient. But um, I'm trying to lean while I have my cord around my neck here to see if I can <laughs> find my box real quick. Let me just take a peek one second. Okay, so I've got a Canon Vixia HV30 for my video camera. Okay. So you do do you do use a separate video camera sometimes, and is that more for the sound, or is it actually more the picture quality? Um, the reason I got it really was to do some more extended things, like if I – like when I spoke at the Blog World Expo conference last year, I stuck that on my tripod and filmed the session I was in. And now okay, so for duration, because you can't really get as much on a two gig card as you would be able to put on the camcorder. Yeah, I think the the current camera I have, I think it it gives me maybe ten minutes of video, so I was able to do sixty minutes on the camcorder. Okay, that's a good point too. Then okay. Yeah, but uh, the, I guess if you don't have to have the length though, like the like it's so much nicer just drop my camera in the dock and have the the video just sucked over to the computer versus having to connect all these wires and, and have to play the tape and have it convert over. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I, I used to have one of the big, huge, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. I mean, I've been doing photography 30 years, so I've got the 35 millimeter cameras. I used to have the old beta camcorder that looked like something that the TV station people carried around and, you know, coming down to when I first switched to digital, it was like a huge change for me because I was like, I don't know, this isn't going to be right. And for about a year, I double shot everything. I shot it with film and with my digital camera until I got to the point where I was like, okay, the digital quality is good enough and I'm tired of scanning the 35 millimeter negatives in order to get them onto the computer. So it's the same thing with video, you know, going from a huge video camera with real tape down to a, 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 a lightweight compact video camera that um, gives you nice, easy to use, easy to transfer files. Videos come a long way even in the last year. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, I guess maybe this could be a whole other podcast, but I, as far as taking the video, just like you're saying about the settings for, like, not using more than 500 by 500, mm -hmm. do you have any recommendations for video specs for trying to go to YouTube, or maybe that should just be a whole different topic? Um, we can do it as a whole different topic, but just as a quick note, I would say get the biggest file you can when you're capturing the um, the actual video, because unlike photos, you know, you can go back and snap most pictures again, uh, but sometimes with video, you're capturing something that's only going to happen once, and the higher quality you have when you do the capture, it's easy to convert it once you get to your computer. You know, there's a lot, um, there's a lot less expensive video editing software now, and if you shoot it in 720 HD, you can convert it to, you know, the 640 not HD and and have it be able to play and be able to upload it to YouTube. Yeah, and one thing I definitely would like to point out for if you're doing the video, one thing that you get sort of held back on if you're using a, a small camera, digital camera, or even like a flip camera that's HD, is oftentimes they don't have a port to do an external mic, which makes a big difference for the that's audio. That's huge. Yeah, that's huge. That's one of the reasons I never went to a flip. Um, I wanted to get a flip, and it's also one of the reasons I recently purchased a Sony DSLR, and it doesn't do video, and I caught some flack for buying a camera that doesn't do video, and I'm like, no, because either your camera does still photography really well, or it does video really well. And, you know, like you said, your camera is perfect for when you're going to conferences, but you already know that you needed something when you want to record your entire session. And if you're going to take that one step further and you need to get the audio, you need to have an audio external plug that you can put a remote mic into so that you can get better sound. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, for me, whenever I do like a little video podcast, just sitting at my desk, I just use my regular camera. But in those cases, I'm about five feet away from the mic, so it picks it up pretty decent. Right. Yeah, as long as you can be right on top of it, it's fine. But as soon as you get across the room or if you have multiple people talking or if you're trying to record music, you know, you just it just doesn't work. 
Yeah, I agree. So, um, so you mentioned the software a little bit. So, do you, as far as if you're doing video with your camera, do you use Sony Vegas now, or do you use something different? Um, I use Windows Movie Maker a little bit if I only have to do a little bit of stuff, and I'm starting to teach myself Sony Vegas. I've got, I've went through, um, I went through two versions of it already, and I just it scared me. You know, I'm like. I, I don't know what happens when I open this and I don't know what to do. And um, actually using Windows Movie Maker showed me a little bit because it does less. It showed me more because it taught me the basics. And now I can go into Sony Vegas and do some of the more exciting stuff. And um, I think that's a that's a wonderful piece of software to use. And it came with a sound software also. Um, is it SoundForge that came with it? Um, you use it. I bought those separately. Oh, okay. I got the bundle. The last time I upgraded, I got the bundle. So it came with SoundForge, and it actually it helps to take your audio up a notch too, and you can take your audio and do some different things and then add it to video. I'm actually going to get started doing some um, screencasts with um, – Camtasia or Cam Studio, and because of the way it records now, I'm going to be able to play in the other softwares to pump it up and, and do some fun things with it. The problem with me is once I find something I like, I dive into it, and then everything else gets ignored. <laughs> <laughs> so if I start editing videos, I might disappear for a week and then, um, but yeah, Sony Vegas does really neat things like with your titles and your, um, overlay with your URL and, you know, putting things at the end. So, and for affiliates, you know, one thing that they can, um, one thing they can do, one of our favorite networks is share a sale. They actually created a video player where an affiliate can upload the video that they shoot of a product and then put the UR, their affiliate URL to go click and go purchase. You know, people can click right from the video and go through their affiliate link to buy stuff. I haven't played with that yet. So, again, it will be a whole other podcast another day. We can cover video. Yeah, speaking but, of, um, of share sale and pictures, there's a, one of the merchants on there I used. I bought some stuff from recently – Green screen wizard. Do you use a green screen at all? I haven't used a green screen. I saw you do that at AdTech um, in New York in the fall, and that was really fun. So I think that that's something that um, people can start playing with because you can, you know, what was it? We had some people pretending they were surfing, and we were in the middle of the Hilton in in uh, New York City. So there's obviously no surf there. And you had somebody else boxing in a boxing ring, I think. So Yeah, that was Heiko. <laughs> yeah, so that'll be something fun to play with, too, down the road. Um, you know, what, what webmasters and what affiliates need to understand about this whole thing is that photos bring uniqueness to your website. Even if you're featuring, you know, all the same text about products as everybody else, you can bring uniqueness to your website using um, photos and video. And ironically, we've been planning this now for about a week. And then a couple of days ago, I saw a Google video about how Google likes to use their image search to direct people to websites now. And they have a pretty sophisticated image search that does a lot more than what it used to do. And it doesn't just take people to the image. It takes people to the page that the image is on. So you can use your photos as an additional way to do search engine optimization and to set your site apart from all the other sites that selling the same widgets that you're trying to sell. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, one thing I was thinking about for, a, I guess, a business use for the like the green screen wizard thing, like they have a for thirty bucks plus shipping, they have a five by seven pop up screen, like the one I had at AdTech. Okay. The whole whole big thing with like um a big holder and stuff and. It was sort of a bulky thing, but like this pop-up one they have, like it, it gets like really small and it's very compact, easy to store, and um, and so you could maybe take pictures of yourself in front of that and then just change like your avatars around with putting like funny little backgrounds behind them and stuff. That's awesome. I I need the link to that. <laughs> yeah, well, build yourself a share sale link and put it in the show notes here. Okay, all right, and that's greenscreen.com is the name of the company, right? 
Greenscreenwizard. Greenscreenwizard.com. Okay. And they've got yeah, necessary program I at share sale. To, I used to do professional photography at cat shows and at weddings, but at cat shows, I used to use a, a background system that was horrendous. It was like two huge, po- three huge poles, the two to hold the one up that held the fabric. And then, you know, we had big, huge pieces of fabric and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, these days it would be so much easier to just use a little pop-up like what you're talking about and then just change out the background to match the cat so that it's not, you know, you can't have a, a silver cat on a purple background or <laughs> I think we just lost about 18 people that were listening. They just turned off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but one, one practical use of the green screen is, I guess, for a personal use. Back in December, I was putting together and trying to get a good picture of all my kids for a Christmas card. Oh, yeah. Son- and my son was sick, so I took a picture of my daughters with Santa Claus. And I took a green screen of him dressed up and just snuck him into the picture that we sent out. Nice. Nice. Well, and, you know, with four kids, it becomes harder and harder to get them to all be happy, smiling, and, you know, somebody not grimacing or making faces. So you can you can collage them together like that. That's awesome. Yeah, it looked pretty seamless. I, I was surprised by how good it looked. It's funny. Very cool. Well, maybe we'll have to do a whole podcast just on using the green screen once I get it and play with it a little bit, and we can give people tips and tricks. Yeah, yeah, because the like this company, Green Screen Wizard, they you can also get a software that they make, and it comes with all kinds of backgrounds and things. And I guess you could also go to a stock photo site and get that too. So you could just mm-hmm. standing there and put yourself in front of a waterfall or whatever. Mhm. Yep. Yeah. Again, going back to those vacation pictures, you know, you take a bunch of photos. Uh, out, you know, you you're you're the one taking the photos, so you're never in the photos, and then you can take a photo of you, you know, pointing to the Statue of Liberty or whatever. You can, you know, you can put yourself into them. I can yeah. see a lot of fun things that people could do with that. Yeah, but I can. I'll probably have to do sometime in my lifetime a picture of the Jets with the Super Bowl trophy. <laughs> You'll have to do it on a green screen. <laughs> yeah, because it's not going to happen in real life. <laughs> We won't talk about how about those Jets. Brett Favre, way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess some um, a lot of good stuff there. So any other last pointers you have for the, the folks? You know, I think the only, you know, the last thing is that just make sure that you don't use photos on your website that are detrimental to your website. If the picture doesn't come out the way you wanted it to and you can't fix it in Photoshop, just ditch it, you know, try something else. Um, and just make sure that when you, you put up a picture that it's not the full size photo, you know, don't put the 400, the 4,000 by 3,000 image up with a, with a height and width tag, making it 500 by 400, because then you're going to kill your page download times and, you know, just be smart and be careful. And when you're shopping for a camera, just keep in mind what you're going to use it for. You know, you're not going to use your little Casio to take prints that are going to be 30 by 40 inches, but they're going to be fine for a website. Yeah. yeah one last thing I have a question about that I'm curious is I, I buy a lot of stock photos for like Feedfront Magazine and different things. And I usually mm-hmm. use iStockPhoto.com, but I ran into a company called Shutterstock at South mm-hmm. Southwest. And it seemed like they were pretty good. They have like a deal where you can get um, like packages, like a monthly thing. Like I think, let me see here. You can download 750 high res images a month for 249. Wow. So I was wondering if you had a recommendation of like what your favorite stock photo company is. My favorite stock photo company is me. <laughs> well, if you happen to need like some like a picture of the Eiffel Tower right away or something. Yeah, um, I would say iStock Photo because they have you know for most generic people that generic webmasters that only need a couple photos here and there and they don't really need um, a lot of high res like you need more high res than other people do. I would say iStock Photo and, um, you know, when you, the one that you just mentioned, what was that one? Stock. It's, it's called Shutterstock.com. Shutterstock.com or Jupiter Images. <laughs> Those would be the ones that if it's, you know, I mean, 249 a month is kind of steep for a lot of people unless they're using a lot of images. Um, Jupiter, though, I think you can, can you do singles? We'll have to do a little more research on that. But the other thing, too, like I mentioned earlier, Flickr now has a Creative Commons license where if you do a search on Flickr and you are looking for images that you can use, check the licensing on the image. And if it says Creative Commons, you can use that image 
um, sometimes under certain conditions. Like as long as you give them a photo credit or a link back, you might be able to do that. And several people have contacted me to use photos on their websites that they found in my Flickr account. And you can, you know, if, if they don't have a Creative Commons, you can contact them and ask them what they would charge to license it. Yeah, I'm not sure how often this happens, but I I had one. There was, was some kind of, like, local travel site for Boston, but I had taken a picture of the hotel where Affiliate Summit was last August. And this company that likes to just get a bunch of, I guess, random, like, amateur photos to show different areas around the city, they contacted me because they found me, I guess, by searching for this hotel name on Flickr. Mm-hmm. And they gave me photo credit and a link back on their Yeah, site. mine was uh, mine was San Francisco. A travel site in San Francisco used several of my photos from San Francisco. So, you know, there are people there are uh, there are people starting to to use Flickr that way. Getty Images just bought the rights to just bought Flickr and bought the rights to be able to go through people's images and pick out the ones that they want to offer for their larger stock photo business for licensing. But again, you know, I mean, the amount of photos that are available on Flickr, and it's pretty easy to contact people through their contact button if they want to be contacted. And you can find a lot of really nice, usable photos right there on Flickr. Yeah. It's Maybe cool. not so much the conference stuff because, you know, photos of people have to have releases. So, you know, for those, you might want to stick with iStock Photo. But if you're looking for photos of places and, you know, that don't show people's faces and that type of thing, then um, Flickr would be a good place to go looking. Very cool. Well, tons of great advice there from you. So I think um, it will be very helpful for people. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on Affiliate ABCs and, uh, you know, grilling me. Um, as always, it's, it's always great to talk to you, and I love listening to all your podcasts every week. So um, I, I enjoyed this, and maybe we can do some others down the line talking more about, you know, using photography and using video because you're, you know, you and Missy are, are pretty good at the whole video thing, and um, I'm good at offline video so i'm making the switch over to online video and uh you know maybe we can pick up some topics uh once a month or so yeah excellent yeah it'd be great to i think it'd be helpful for a lot of people to have some advice on video editing and in different ways and different options for like i know a lot of people have old vcr tapes and stuff and they like to convert those so maybe help people with different tools you can use to do that sort of thing Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, um, you know, a lot of people just take photography for granted and they, you know, they look at people's websites and then they look at them and say, how do you do that? And they don't think of asking. So um, thanks for listening to Affiliate ABCs and you can find all of our podcasts at affiliateabcs.com, which redirects you directly to geekcast.fm, where we're happy to have all of our um, podcasts hosted and if you have any questions just put comments on the blog post where you found this so have a great day and thanks for listening